Welcome everybody to another evening at the Quill and Tankard with assuredly your favorite moderators of the Song of Ice and Fire subreddit. Uh, we're going to talk about episode 3 of season 7 of Game of Thrones entitled The Queen's Justice. I am Michael, better known as Bookshelf Stud. And I am Eliana, better known as Glass Table Girl. I'm Joe Magician, also known as Matt. I'm Samuel, better known as Sam. Ah. Admiral Curd, Aaron. Hello. Hello. Well, just like this episode, let's not waste any time and jump straight into the the big thing that everyone was like really looking forward to, which was I guess John and Danny finally meeting up, which they've already met on the cover of Entertainment Weekly for years now, but at last, um <laughs> Their characters get to meet in the show. Yeah, are those canon? Nobody knows. Yeah, so we finally got to it. We finally got to that, you know, the, the series is over now, basically. Right, there goes Song of Ice and Fire. Well, John first arrives on the ship, and I was kind of expecting it to be Theon arriving back on the coast of Dragonstone, but they, they got right to it Yeah, with that. Yeah, they, they really didn't waste any time. The first dialogue was him and Tyrion, right? Yeah, having their old buddy-buddy back from the first few episodes. Yeah. Lots of callbacks, eh, Sam? Oh, I was swimming in him this up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> swimming in him. And Masande in here asked John to hand over his weapons, which I guess maybe the writers were trying to drum up this threat that John might be killed or something by Danny with the, the threat of the Mad King's daughter sort of deal. But I don't think anyone watching the show actually believed that Danny would kill John like that. So yeah. it comes off as strange because Longclaw is especially valuable in the context of the White Walkers. And this would have been a scene where it would have really impacted Tyrion immediately where John's like, I can't give away this sword. I'm not handing this sword over. You can take all their swords, but I need to make sure I have this because it kills White Walkers. And Tyrion just like looks at him and he's like, I'll speak to Danny about it. Okay. It's all these characters who obviously we've followed for so long and you, you almost want to just give them like a whole season of just conversations, catching up with each other, like getting to know each other. I mean, we get a little bit of that with Davos and um, Miss Ande on the way up to Dragonstone. We do. What a conversation that was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a post on this called Davos referenced the most dangerous animal in Planetos by user Padrock. Talking about butterflies. Yeah, I, people might not know this. Anyone else know about butterflies? Including uh, Matt, who just admitted that he's never read The World of Ice and Fire. He's never actually read A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, no. <laughs> so None of us have watched Game of Thrones. None yeah. of us have read A Song of Ice and Fire. We're experiencing the show solely through Reddit posts. Um, no, yeah, but the... <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just waiting until we finish it and get to American Gods. <laughs> um... But but yeah, the the butterflies of Nath. Not many people know this, but if you ever go there, they either carry some sort of horrible disease, or they eat people, or or it's some sort of horrifying fate that befalls you. Um, so that's that's where Masande's from. Very fun fact. I find regular butterflies terrifying. So those Nath really? butterflies would be. Why? Yeah, mm. butterflies Why? and moths. I just you know, yeah. it's not so much the wings; it's the thing in the middle. It freaks me out. The, probos <laughs> the proboscis. <laughs> the body. If that's what you want to call it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Oh, oh, the, the, the most of the butterfly? The <laughs> yeah. Oh. You live in the place of the world with some of the most deadliest animals yeah. around, and you're scared of butterflies. Yeah, I don't mind spiders and snakes, but moths come at your face. <laughs> Ugh, can't stand them. But I saw a post about like this giant spider earlier today. Like The couple couldn't even get out, and you were afraid of butterflies. Yeah, they well, look at them. How can you not be? <laughs> <laughs> Very easily. You be a man, Sam. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Do you think Sir Arthur Dane has a problem with the Sword of the Morning because light it keeps giving off light <laughs> at night and moths are attract to the blade and you just can't get him away? It'd be terrible if he was uh, afraid of moths. Butterfly in the yeah. sky. I can kill lots of people. <laughs> that went a lot better that's... in my head. <laughs> yeah, that's the song of Noth. That's what they sing to that's each their, other all that's the time. National an that, that's their national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't make... <laughs> I had trouble making sense of um, after Davos tries to like strike up a conversation with Masande and she sort of walks away and he says, this place has changed. Like, how? That's what Stannis would have been like if Davos was trying to be friendly to him. Isn't this exactly what Dragonstone is like? <laughs> it's That's changed true. in that it gets lots of lovely exterior shots now. Was Stannis allergic no, to the outside? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's changing that there's sunshine now. I guess. Yeah. We, I think we all know what song Davos had in mind when he was chatting up Missande, right? Reading Rainbow? No, everybody's favorite early 2000s pop tune. You're my butterfly. Oh, yeah, Sugar, yeah, yeah. baby. Sugar, baby. Oh, okay. <laughs> come, my lady. Come, come, my lady. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember this classic. <laughs> it's one of Davos's favorite songs. That's canon. It's, that's in fact the song of ice and fire. <laughs> Played on the harp. <laughs> yeah. Bring. Come, come, my lady. Come, come, my lady. You're my butterfly, sugar baby. Baby. Is that is that Rhaegar Targaryen? <laughs> He's finally singing it. <laughs> that's Jenny's song. Actually, that's uh, the Jenny of Oldstones' song. Oh my god. So, the, speaking of dangerous flying beasts, though, John is also surprised by a dragon that soars right overhead at a convenient point in the dialogue. Oh, Dargans. <laughs> Are you guys finding the dramatic irony about John? Being a Targaryen, like the smash cut when Aegon said, uh, Aemon, sorry, you know, it's a sad thing for a Targaryen to be alone in the world. Yeah. Cut to John. Yeah. John, a user pointed this out in the post discussion thread, user Reef Dog. John saying, I'm not a Stark, and then a dragon literally flying over his head. Exactly. Is it I, laying on too thick? Not thick enough? It's so thick right now. It's It was kind of fun when they did it every once in a while, but they're doing it like every other scene for John. They say something about Targaryen, smash cut to him, and it's like, I get it. There was that scene. Please just say it. That scene last episode with Jan Royce, like <laughs> you, a Targaryen yeah. can't be trusted. You know, like setting. Uh, I, I cut the John. <laughs> it's like they had, come they on. had better just get to him finding out soon. Otherwise, they they, they could just stretch this out forever. Yeah. <laughs> can't Brand just send a raven? He's the three eyed raven now. Just just send one out. Be like John. I, I saw your birth. You are a Targaryen. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you look so beautiful that day. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> I honestly want to do a poll and just see if there's anyone that hasn't picked up on the fact that John's a Targaryen yet. Are there sh- are there watchers out there that haven't figured this out? I'd bet good money the majority who don't go online and don't talk to other people about it haven't. Yeah, they think that Ned and Lyanna yeah. had John. Right. Like there were legitimately not people joke that theories. Scene. Not no, joke theories. Like no, that wasn't ones. a joke. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because they never talked or sh- they never showed Rhaegar. The show doesn't push Rhaegar hard enough. I know. Oh, that's right. So what oh, they yeah, got we talked from about the this. Tower of Joy scene oh. is that Ned and Lyanna. The stock music. <laughs> John. That's right. What are you supposed to think? Like, if you're just a casual watcher, yeah. like, how else? Yeah. Are- Game of Thrones, incest. Yeah. That's true. That's right. They prime you to think that. <laughs> it's a subversion of the trope from the first episode. It's like a callback or something. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Up in a tower, right? Just like in the first episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's... Yeah. Bran opens his eyes just like little baby John. That, it is actually set no, up pretty but... well on the show, now that I think about it. I almost prefer it. <laughs> Go away, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as I guess as they're walking up, they're being observed, which was a shot from the trailer. A lot of these shots were in the season trailers. Like John coming up the yeah. Dragonstone <laughs> walk. Um, yeah, this one was. With, oh, yeah. N- yeah. Is it a coincidence that the season seven trailer had so many shots from season seven? I don't know. It seems suspicious. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. You'd think they could sneak in some season six footage because they already have it. Or season eight. Or season eight. Yeah. Yeah. Or some other shows, actually. Well. Like Ballers <laughs> starring. Uh, <laughs> so that Rick and Morty but, So uh, Melisandre is obviously in the trailer. She was looking down at people coming dragons. So it turns out it's her and Varys watching John arrive at Dragonstone. Mm-hmm. Um, and she and Varys have some classically cryptic dialogue, I guess, in that they both sort of talk around each yeah. other. And, Ooh, I know mm. so much about Varys you. Varys threatens her life. Mm. Says if you ever come back to Westeros, you'll probably be killed. I guess that's sort of a leftover from his hatred of the Red Priests, or Red Priestesses. Mm. Yeah. That he uh, established in Marine from the um, getting cut. Did I ever tell you about when I was cut? <laughs> <laughs> Then he found his warlock. <laughs> <laughs> what happens later in the episode anyway. when John and Danny finally talk and John, we'll get to this later, but John reflects on how bad he is at selling his position. I thought it was not great that Melisandre is leaving when she has shown the ability to get people to believe really crazy things. <laughs> like she's the PR person that John needs. Davos is great and he's hilarious, but mm. Mm. Melisandre is the exact right person to sell people on the strange and supernatural. Do you think, how do you think she's going to come back next season? Because it seems like she is going to come back, right? That was what she was saying. And she still see Arya again. Yeah, like, she said she's coming back. So mm-hmm. When it's the darkest point, when John will allow her to be around because he has nowhere else to turn or something like that. And three days have passed. Look to the east. Or she's just going <laughs> to show up on a boat and everybody's like having dinner at the very end. She's like, I'm here for the party. She's going to go find Aomer in the Rohirrim. <laughs> well, actually, she might be on her way to get the Volantine fleet. Get all the um, hmm. the Red Temple. Get everybody on a boat and send them to Westeros. 
I was kind of wondering about that. Yeah, if that's why she's going to Volantis, like you know, whip up a slave rebellion in Volantis yeah. or something. Um, there are theories in the books that the the Volantine slaves mm. will become part of. Yeah, Danny's uh, Danny's harem. <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it. Army, probably not harem. Or anything <laughs> yeah, but that. Yeah, really. probably uh, her <laughs> army. Military, yeah, actually. <laughs> Supporters, <laughs> not sex group. <laughs> so maybe he's, maybe she'll show up with her her hair me hair me. <laughs> wow, I don't know. Uh, that sounds okay. like an army made of hair. You okay, buddy. <laughs> well, and then so finally, after all of these uh, these tertiary characters and secondary characters meet each other, finally we get to Danny and Johnny meeting for the first time hmm. it leads off at that comedic beat with davos uh, the tight danny's titles and then davos uh oh yeah oh he's king of the north yeah that's <laughs> after john is, gives him the side eye is davos that good because i mean like he could think of titles here there's this great post by a uh, a uh, user l o hair who says if john had equivalent titles mm-hmm. which he kind of does yeah he has the king of king of the north the king of winter the actually, I don't think the king of the winter is named in the in the thread, but freer of free folk or whatever <laughs> the heck you want to call it, breaker knees, <laughs> the beater of bastards. Preston Jacobs had a funny thing on his video about um he the guy with the disappearing wolf. Mm. <laughs> That's true. Oh, John would be the guy with the disappearing wolf. <laughs> the Lord, <laughs> yeah, nice. I do like uh, all the people suggesting him. knower of nothing. Um. It's a it's an appropriate title. Kisser mm-hmm. of Lords. <laughs> <laughs> but he has titles like Davos could I would actually yeah. find it funnier if Davos was like fumbling through there trying to come up with a bunch <laughs> of titles than just like he's king in the north. He's like, uh, he's um the freer of the free folk, <laughs> uh the <laughs> Lord Commander, but no long um <laughs> We're still working on. The, we're working on these. The, the white wolf. I mean, the white wolf. Come on, like that's 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 yeah. that's that's a basic. Yeah. one. But they don't want to call attention to the fact yeah. that Ghost isn't there. <laughs> that's right. I, I honestly, that did actually. I felt like they sacrificed Davos, threw him under the bus a little bit there because he is a better hype man than that. Like when he was working for Stannis, he he he's good at listing the titles. Uh, I also Same enjoyed time. that Kit turned his acting up to eleven with those eye movements. <laughs> he really got into the scene. Sold it. <laughs> Right, right, Sam. He, su- he certainly did better than Amelia. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Ooh. Mm. I know two of the greatest Ooh. actors in cinema TV history meeting for the first time on screen. Um, and one of the greatest directors, you know, staging it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I never thought when John would finally meet Danny that John would be out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow! Great, uh, great decision making. Yeah, it's true though. Maybe isn't that's it? the that's the twist. Davos the Onion Knight is in fact actually the secret Targaryen. True. <laughs> there it is. After all, Davos backwards is Savod. Oh, and he's oh. gonna save all the second <laughs> kingdoms. Yeah. He's gonna climb to the top of an arrowhead that looks like a mountain. Oh, or a mountain that looks there. like an arrowhead wow. and roll onions down it and they're gonna turn into giant snowballs and kill all the White Walkers. Oh and then yeah. the Savod kinda sounds like my lod. I don't know what to do with that, but it's there. Oh. Whoa. You're like a gardener right. with your jokes. Was it everything you guys hoped it would be? I thought they were they were both as stubborn as I thought they would be. I really enjoyed that John finally like found his confidence of being the king of the north after he didn't really want to seem to be it anymore uh, and uh stood up when it mattered danny challenges him yeah. he's like no i'm the king of the north go screw yourself it kind of reminded me and i guess there was no other way for this scene to play out but the fact that they like weren't working together but the audience is rooting for them to work together mm. sort of reminded me of when you have people getting together to play D for the first time and they, they don't know why their characters are supposed to work together in character. So you just have like a half hour of people sitting at a table going, well, my rogue doesn't trust you because he's from the streets and like you're making up reasons not to trust each other. And I, there's no way they could have played this scene differently, I guess. So they shouldn't just like like each other immediately. But there were some lines in, in there that kind of felt like characters looking for excuses to not work together, I guess. It's consistent in the story. I'm not I'm not trying to kvetch about it too much. It's just... I thought it was admirable they actually used the history correctly. That was something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Except for the part where she said no. that it was like 300 years of peace, the most peaceful that 
the Seven Kingdoms have known. It may be the most peaceful. I mean, except for the part with the Dargans and the dancing <laughs> and, the, and there was, the other wars. There were maybe a total of like uh, 40 years that were the most peaceful Westeros has ever known. I think I think that might be right. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good for 40 Westeros. Is, 40 is good, yeah. That's yeah. true. <laughs> I thought John came off, again, because he's sort of new to being a king and a lord, that he came off like as I would expect to, sort of like an amateur in this one. But I thought Danny came off, uh, I don't know what the best way to describe it. She came off kind of childish a little bit in the in her mm-hmm. arguments, where after being the queen of marine and like ruling over tens of thousands of people, I expect her what she would say to John would be better than like, I've had a hard life, I deserve to be queen. I thought she would have something better than that in her arsenal at the back of everything she was saying. Yeah, I feel you. I'm not sure what, but I don't know. It, it seemed it seemed off for her. It seemed really unqueenly. Well, yeah, if, I guess if the last couple seasons have been establishing sort of her credentials as a ruler and sort of genuinely trying to rule and things like that, which is something yeah. someone else says in, in the episode, Tyrion says, I think, in the episode, right, is that she, she stayed in Marine and yeah. chose to rule. You would think she would use that as as ammo to say, look, I've been a queen. I know how to yeah. do this. Like, Cersei's just a nut. Um. (laughs) that's true (laughs) i think if you wanted to explain it you could say that through most of her time people for like the last few years at least the last few seasons people have treated danny with a lot of respect even if they hate her and john is basically saying like i don't recognize any of your authority i don't care about your dragons what you're doing is wrong and nobody's really done that to her in a long time maybe like the last time would have been when she was still like cal drogo's wife that might have been the last time that kind of thing happened where someone really disrespected her in front of her it's been a lot of talk on twitter around this around our podcast uh poor <laughs> quentin and vanessa cole talking about is this going to be the way that it will happen in the books what are your guys' thoughts on that hmm. Hmm. Oh. see there's a series of us called a song of Wait, I-, I thought we just established that we don't read books ouch what i mean I, I kind of feel like I've always assumed their meeting in the books would come much later in the story, I guess. Um, that they, they wouldn't yeah, be... Yeah, I agree. ...like, planning a war together, but rather, like, you know, to, as the final yeah. confrontation approaches, they, they meet each other. That's um, true. I, at the point they're at in the story in the books, I'm not sure John could get to Dragonstone because, like, there's an enormous blizzard covering the entire north. I'm not that sure too. he could get to White Harbor and get on a boat <laughs> that too. and then make it all the way down with that weather. So it may take John going mm. south, but I'm not really sure how he's going to do that. Well, the blizzard might pass. <laughs> You've got these characters who I don't think any other drama on TV has had their two main characters apart for this yeah. long of a period of time. Can anybody else recall any story like that? Um, but it's kind of like, well, if you're going to do these two characters meeting in a character driven drama, that should come mm. right at the very end of a climax for the, the story, like right before the final battle of the dawn. I've always pictured it as John being at the head of an army and Danny being at the head of the army and the two of them meeting on like a grassy plain that's like snow drifting and stuff. And uh-huh. they're both at seats of power. And they they have misconceptions about each other. Like Danny thinks John is coming down to usurp her throne, but he's just running away from the White Walkers. And Danny's tra- heading up to like because she believes wrong things about what she's heard about the King of the North. And the two of them meet together, and they have this great like tense moment of heightened conflict where everything from the two stories has peaked at this moment. And this is where it stands, the entire story. And, like, nobody's thinking about any other arcs in this moment at all. And it's just, like, when they kind of shoved this in here, I feel like it shoved in to just have John and Danny meet. And I would have prefer- preferred to see it, like, Sansa and Littlefinger go down south instead. Because it just, it doesn't feel like the appropriate climax to me for these two characters after all that they've they've been apart. And to bring them together so quickly like this, like everything, everybody was waiting for Danny to get to Westeros. And it's like two episodes in now to her being in Westeros, they decided to have John and Danny meet. And it's kind of like, that wasn't enough. You don't have like anything else to build off of with that where you got to have John down here. They're using up everything that they got in the tank. What? Wow. Whoa. Wow. Well, I think- the fact they're splitting, like they've got a season seven and a season eight, I think means they have to kind of split and 
assign different arcs and, you know, squeeze the juice out of Mm -hmm. what's Mm -hmm. from George's ideas and what they've got of themselves to stretch out over like a year. (sighs) Uh, You know, A Dream of Spring doesn't have to be split in half and have like a set ending. Like George doesn't even do that in book four and five. You know, they they just kind of peter out. But on TV, you can't do that so much. I don't know if that explains making Danny and John meet this quick, but I think it it explains some of the weird narrative moves in that something's going really quick uh, and feeling like they're expending their uh, energy on yeah. things in that way. Mm-hmm. But also, I think <laughs> a lot of it is just audience expectations. You know, they stalled a lot with season six, five, and four even. And I think at this point, audiences really want to be in endgame mode, even if this won't be the book's endgame mode. You know, I feel like there's an implicit promise in the show that eventually these disparate characters will meet up. And, you know, they're doing that so much with the Starks and with Danny and John and everything. So, yeah, I, I don't know if it's in, a, in an appropriate climax and not what's happening in the books and something more driven from that way, like Aaron says, but might well be. I mean, it might be like, it might even be something like a similar beat in that. So, spoilers for all the people listening, but like, George R. R. Martin says that Daenerys and Tyrion won't even meet until close to the end of The Winds of Winter. Right? Yeah, well and into that's the book, the sixth I think. Book. And yeah. so that well means. Into- For most of the book, they're still apart, I think is the yeah. quote. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. but Daenerys, that means Daenerys doesn't even reach Westeros until like at the very end of The Winds of Winter or towards the beginning of, of A Dream of Spring. And that means that whenever she and John meet, has to be in A Dream of Spring. Unless John's wogging wow. too. <laughs> <laughs> but John has to come back to life. Maybe he won't. Mm. Nah, just kidding. Nah, I mean, I mean, I, uh, I guess I, it depends on their end goal with with John and Danny meeting. If they need them to meet so that they can build a romantic relationship between them, which is kind of what I got from these Ooh. scenes. A little bit of a little mm. bit of you know, that's what it kind of looked like. A little bit of Targaryen yeah. tension. I feel like uh, I think it was D.B. Weiss, not uh, David. It was either inside the episode. Or it was in an article. He was saying something about how um, because Danny and John are both young and. <laughs> you know, similar ages and both, you know, conventionally attractive, that there was oh, there was a specific quote was something like, John saw all that and was surprised by that, but had to set it aside because he had work to do. And so, yeah, I definitely, I don't know if Kit and yeah. Amelia were having the chemistry, chemistry necessarily, but I feel like it was intended. Mm. Yeah. I, Kit there Harrington was, made a similar comment, yeah. There are scenes when they're standing out and John is asking for the dragon glass where, like, Amelia is kind of, like, eyeing yeah. him off to the yeah, side true. quite a bit. And it's not like, mm-hmm. he's like, have you seen Shireen's room? <laughs> like, who would make their child live in a place like this? <laughs> have you seen the bottles? Oh, my God. <laughs> have you seen those vats? <laughs> have you seen the yeah. jars? I've got these jars I want to show you. <laughs> have, you seen, have you seen my uh, my war table? <laughs> it's uh, slightly it's used smell to it. yeah <laughs> let me tell you john you don't have a map yet you don't have a war map we need to get you one up in the north it's true. everybody my else painted table <laughs> you've got the black coloring you just gotta yeah right he got the memo about the the uniform i think what this means is that they don't see the climax as john and danny meeting because they're doing it so early mm-hmm. it seems that they're going to have the climax be the reveal that john's a targaryen and what that does between him and danny because they've oh, been layering it on right. so yeah. hard this season, and their brand's like, I have to talk to him. <laughs> and they did it so early, so there's a lot of time for them to get to know each other and then have their relationship completely flipped by John's identity changing so drastically. Yeah. And Danny does really make point. the point that she's uh, the mm-hmm. last Targaryen again this episode. To yeah, John. They, she said so, it like four times. Yeah. yeah, so that's a good point. So da- there's a user who posted a thread that asks a really good question, I think. Um, this user is 69 o'clock. And their thread is... Nice. <laughs> nice. Oh, Hot. really? Is it really that hard for Danny to believe that White, that White Walkers and the Army of the Dead are coming is 69 o'clock's question. Danny, first off, has dragons, has seen magic practiced by the warlocks. Melisandre popped out of nowhere last episode and was like, hey, there's a prophecy. Princess, princess was promised. So why is Danny not believing this beyond the fact that it's just a ridiculous thing to claim? Probably because John just came down there and said there are the army of the undead and White Walkers and the Night King, and that's how he sold it. He didn't like explain yeah. what any of this stuff yeah. was, <laughs> yeah. Which they've never really done in the show because all of a sudden in last season you have John saying the Night King, and then Bran says it in uh, the the Three Eyed Raven, and mm-hmm. then you have Benjen also say Night King. So it's implied like there's kind of some legend in the past that there's a Night King. But they've never in the show had the dialogue where 
John could have been with Danny. He's been like, there's this legend about this king who's born of ice, who leads the undead in, in the long night. And this is what it was to establish what that is in the lore of the story. Yeah. Rather than like on the DVD extras. <laughs> and so I felt like they, they needed to like have that in the actual story to just some degree, just like a couple lines. So you know what other characters know already about what the Night King is right. expected sure. to be. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I found interesting with Danny and John colliding in the narrative now in terms of the magic stuff, Danny not believing John stuff, is the series is mostly like three stories. It's the Westerosi intrigue and civil wars, John's, which doesn't have much magic apart from some dashes of Stannis now and again. John's stuff to the north with the others and, you know, wagging and plenty of magic. Danny's stuff to the east with the dragons, which are really magic, and it's got more of that mystical stuff. Mm -hmm. So they're coming to each other, these two more magical parts of the tree out of stories in the series, but they're not really, like, sparking each other. Like, you'd think the magic would meld mm. fine, but it doesn't really. They don't, they're not on the same wavelength, even though they both have the heightened level of magic compared to the, you know, main Westerosi story. I just thought that was an interesting yeah. thing. So the way I see it, because one of the things that interests me most in the books, that character driven development right so for me when i see daenerys as disbelieving the idea of an army of the dead for me she disbelieves the army of the dead not because she disbelieves the idea of magic with the dragons and her being fireproof it's that she's tried to bring the dead back mm -hmm. to life before you know she tried to save her husband and that ultimately failed mm -hmm. people forget that the whole reason she even has dragons in the first place is born out of her accepting that death is not reversible. Her husband, her son and stars, and her child will never come back to her. For her to suddenly have that thrown in her face and to feel like the dead can walk, can come back to life, it just sort of shakes her own life experiences and the heartbreak that she's been through this whole time. And like, yes, she has dragons, but the only reason she has dragons is because she's already failed at being able to bring the dead exactly. back to life. Damn, that's a great and point. I think it's a great point. Yeah. Right she has empirical proof it doesn't work <laughs> in her eyes. I mean, and I think Tyrion brings up an excellent point in his conversation with John, where they talk about his magnificent brooding, where he's like, it's not a reasonable thing to walk into a room, meet somebody for the first time and tell them to change all their plans on your word. She doesn't know John. She doesn't know he's telling the truth. He could be a crazy person. Tyrion eventually convinces her, but if somebody did that, John uh, almost exactly says that. If somebody told him what he's saying, he would think they were crazy too. That's why Danny doesn't believe him. And Eliana, I wonder if they're not going to go there with John's resurrection, maybe. That could be the reason that's sort of getting played up as a plot point. Yeah, I like to think that's part of why, because then, you know, it becomes a question of like, yeah. why you and not Drogo? How come you were brought back? What makes you so great that the person that I loved and lost wasn't worthy of totally, being yeah. brought back to life or maybe even what went wrong like it was the horse i tried and i lost my child trying to do this what more did yeah. i need to no, do no yeah I, I, that's such a i'm so yeah that's such a good idea cuz i think yeah that's there's a lot of potential there for john and danny to just explore that that whole concept of resurrection which is a hot button issue mm. Mm. there was one more thing i found interesting in that whole front loaded John and Danny sequence, and I saw the subreddit was reacting to this a bit too. This is more on the visual side. A user, Archer1215, had a thread saying, can I just say that Mark Mylod, the Mark Mylod, did a phenomenal <laughs> job on the Queen's Justice, and there's a bunch of users there, uh, you know, agreeing to some extent, and I thought, and there were some things I thought were interesting he did visually. I'll pull up some images here. Mm. Firstly... In the opening sequence, how we get to John and Danny's conversation and John points out, you know, we're all children playing at a game. He's making the small comparison, like we're all small compared to these larger issues. You know, this is, mm -hmm. it might mm -hmm. be the biggest, you know, theme of the series is like the whole people are squabbling instead of facing their real problems. And then Mylod, I don't know how much this was Mylod and how much was the director of photography, which was a man called PJ Dillon, uh, who did What is Dead May Never Die in season two, one of the best episodes of the show, but he mm. normally works on Vikings. Yeah. Anyway, we get all these shots where all the humans are very, very small in comparison either to the dragons, the keep of Dragonstone, or the natural landscape around Dragonstone. And I like how that played into John's point 
you know, with the comparison of scale, we're all tiny yeah. compared to these bigger things. That's true. That's a great point. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. The only other one I had on this opening sequence, interesting visually, was Aaron astutely pointed out how John was out of focus in the shots in that sequence, and that was not a great thing visually. But something I found interesting was how Danny generally took up a lot more of the frame. She had a lot more close-ups, whereas John was often in the wider shots, and he often had Davos in the frame with him. I thought that was an interesting power move, you know, to make Danny literally take up much more of our oh. screens and see much more oh, sure, right. yeah, powerful. Yeah. John much less, you know, yeah. like literally less. Yeah, he's even hunched over a little bit too. Like you were talking about with Tywin and Joffrey. Right. Yeah. Uh, true. Yeah, some of that's good directing, but I didn't really feel like there was outstanding directing in the episode. Like when you're shooting a scene that's outdoors like that, you expect there to be like some wide shots and some close-up shots of John and Danny. So it's kind of just like, I, I I get what they're going for. And that's good that they're showing them as small in this world. But when John and Danny meet, I didn't feel like the cinematography really emphasized that there were these two main characters who are meeting for the first time because you have John out of focus uh, when they first meet because Davos has to deliver his entrance. It minimalizes John to the extent of like everything that he's done for a comedic moment also which is in the script i think it would have been more interesting if like john and danny were in focus more of the time and davos was like speaking in the background but he was out of focus as far as like this is about john meeting danny in the king of the north um and also like up when they're in winterfell it reminds me of what isabel said about them not wanting to show off the costumes there's no shot of emphasizing that the armor looks cold or a creative way to do that in the show, Sansa's standing there. She's like, "Oh, is the armor? It's they need. It needs to have more leather on it, but it doesn't visually look cold to people in the audience. It's just kind of like a throwaway, and they're walking and talking, and it it's just kind of like meh, blocked, I guess. I'd be interested to see in the rest of the season if John's continuing relationship with Danny actually builds off how like much he was pushed out." like how he was out of focus and small in the frame. And like you said, it wasn't really staged as a meaning of titans of the narrative or anything. If they just skip that and have them more equalized, I think you'd definitely be right that that was a poorly thought out scene visually. But I'd be interested if he like slowly comes up in a graces or something, if it kind of retroactively mm. makes more sense of some of the oddness of that scene. There's also a weird yeah. shot of when Jamie was pouring the poison into Olena's glass. Because of the way that it's framed, it looks like he's pouring it into his own glass. It's just the Princess oh, yeah. Bride. I don't know. If- <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I could see Nikolai yeah. being Wesley in like a remake. But anyway, <gasps> so. <laughs> oh. um, Buttercup's it, baby? It isn't the Buttercup's way that they. <laughs> oh my God. We, we got stories about Buttercup's baby, Michael and I do. <laughs> um, but like, isn't the way that they shot the throne room of Dragonstone kind of similar anyway to how they shot a lot of the Miranese scenes where Danny was in power and she was high up and everybody was out there small mm, so, yeah I don't know maybe it's just a thing that they do for throne rooms cameras aside throne rooms are literally staged you know to make yeah. someone higher and bigger and look more powerful than someone yeah. else yeah <laughs> yeah True. yeah exactly so I don't know I thought it was interesting where the resurrection thing where John doesn't want Davos talking about it and Danny remembers it later. We know what they're talking about. John doesn't want Davos to reveal that he's undead. But from Danny's perspective, the phrase taking a dagger to the heart to play up their romantic thing, she might take that to mean like, oh, she's did he lose his wife or something like that? Did he lose like somebody he loved just oh. like me? Oh my God, we have something to connect over. That's kind of hilarious if Davos was listing out like his accomplishments and he was like saying you know he's king and he's united the free folk and the northmen also he got his heart broke once in a bad relationship well <laughs> if he gave it up for the north like like uh like right uh, yeah zora high and nissa nissa that kind of thing yeah like giving up something big also he cried a bunch one time <laughs> yeah yeah and that's why very... john is like covering it up he's like no don't don't tell her about that, that... Don't, don't tell him my broken heart <laughs> if you want them to relate over something danny thinks about drogo all the time still so mm-hmm. This would yeah. be something. Mm-hmm. She doesn't have red hair. She's not a redhead. But she yeah. is kissed by fire. Um, she will be when John gets there. Uh, <laughs> wow. Anyway, speaking <laughs> of innuendo, we move on from Dragonstone to 
King's Landing, where we once again get another lovely parade for the people of King's Landing, who apparently have no plays to attend or soap operas to watch (laughs) because their entire entertainment is watching women paraded through the streets of King's Landing. No No riots to rage. No riots. Yeah, come on. They should really be rioting. I was amused thinking of how d d were like literally marching down their riding failures through King's Landing and everyone was like throwing, you know, rotten fruit at them and laughing at them, you know, in the form of the sand snakes, which were yeah. very poorly taken by audiences. <laughs> I just thought that was very funny. No, I have no that, idea if they're intending that. <laughs> right. There's that one yeah. guy, they just like really focused in on him and like made his sound clear so we could hear him say whore whore yeah, whore yeah. three times and i was like yeah. what are you doing <laughs> he's uh, calling her a whore that's what a, do you think he's doing you know that's a great this was all a meta commentary on how the yeah. fans don't like books four and five featuring the great joys and the sand snakes whoa it actually was a very meta episode like they had Tyrion meta john about his brooding yeah so there was a post by user mcgraw 23 which is presumably the year they were born in. Craw. Wrong user. What? That's craw. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's craw. Okay, sorry. Ma- we only, we only do the crow thing for craw 68. <laughs> that's right. Shout out to craw 68. What up? Um, craw! T- in this post by McGraw23 was entitled, Yara was awfully quiet this episode. I guess they're suggesting that Yara has had her tongue cut out by Euron already. Uh, which explains why she's so quiet and why she doesn't respond to Euron's uh, jibes. I don't know. What do you think? What are the, what is, what's the over-under on Yara being tongueless now? I think under. <sighs> are they gonna ha- Would they have her say anything in that scene? Whore! <laughs> <laughs> That's all she says. She's, you're damn like, right. Like, Gloria, she doesn't have her tongue cut out when right. she spits, so yeah. she doesn't say anything, though. It doesn't necessarily mean she has her tongue cut out. Cersei didn't say anything either when she was paraded through the streets. Mm, it's well, true. well yeah. her tongue regrew quickly. <laughs> like her hair. Into that sweet right. bob. Also, yeah. didn't they make um, Yara like a main cast member recently? Like they wouldn't cut out her tongue after after they gave her an upgrade, right? Unless they wanted to really show off her acting chops. She's just gonna mime everything. It's time for Gemma Whelan to yeah. She's in a box a lot. <laughs> She, like, pretends to go downstairs now in the show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, is there stairs behind that couch? <laughs> wow. Yara's so good. She's rowing a boat. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I don't think she necessarily has her tongue cut out, but... it's a cool idea, though. I like the idea. It would be nice to see Euron do some euron type stuff in the show, which, I mean, we, we can talk about this later, I guess, but now's as good a time as any. Talk about Euron. <laughs> yeah, to talk about Euron. I like Euron in the show. And by like him, I don't mean I, oh, what a great person. I mean, like, I'm really enjoying watching Pilu Azbek. Yes. He's great fun. I was expecting them to smash cut from his last line right into a shot of Littlefinger. <laughs> the finger and <laughs> <in> the bum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought they did a really good job this episode of playing up the idea that Euron is a little different for each person. Yeah. yeah. That he's in a way performing to like mm-hmm. i feel like you can really see a huge difference between how he talks to yara and then how he regards cersei and then how he regards yeah. jamie and that aside it's yeah. like a completely Absolutely. different personality for each interaction yeah in a good way i would say <laughs> when i was listening to cogman's interview and i think the reality school is mm-hmm. relativity school whatever he recently did a podcast on last week he mentioned that duality school duality school <laughs> he mentioned that <laughs> euron is a wild card <gasps> mm. wild cards. which is kind of like it's <laughs> yeah. it's our meme on the on the sub about balon Greyjoy being a wild card so i'm wondering uh how much cogman's been reading the r of song of ice and fire maybe he's been reading wild right. cards yeah oh yeah yeah <laughs> Maybe Cogman's going Ace to work on wild cards. Aren't they adapting that into a series soon? Yeah, different studios oh, doing man. that. <laughs> Supposedly. Oh. He's going to have a superhero named Cogman. Well, who's... <laughs> Never mind. <gasps> it's kind of like a Mr. Cog or whatever. A Cogsworth from Cogsworth. Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which oh by the God. way, oh, yeah. reminds me. I was going ma- to say that John is Belle and Danny is the Beast and Tyrion is Lumiere. And John oh, wow. is now her prisoner. <laughs> wow. And, you know. It's, it's we got a whole Beauty and the Beast situation here. And is and is Drogon the little the little Ottoman dog? Yes. 
Yes, that, exactly. <laughs> yes. Anyway, sorry, Perfect. that was backing up a little bit. And we even have a pack of wolves. Oh, yeah. That's right. Perfect. Wolf pack. Anyway, uh, we were talking about Euron, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> he's really popping every time he's on screen. Yeah. Wildly yeah, entertaining. He's fresh. He's doing a great job acting. I actually thought he made um, Nikolai kind of look a little bad when they were interacting because mm. he kind of had the same shocked look on his face the whole time. Yeah, Pilo, and he's he's doing such a great job and being so entertaining and Nikolai's just kind of sitting there going the shock the whole time. I thought it was really great for him. Yeah. He doesn't know yeah. how to handle him. <laughs> Too over yeah. the top for me, buddy. Are you sure you belong <laughs> in this series? The more gormless looks on my adversaries. Yeah, I think they they have chemistry in that aspect. Yeah. Yeah. I, I and it also to me, that seems that reads like book you're on a lot like going up to jamie and openly mocking him oh, what for, he did the victorian yeah, yeah. Like, like this kind of cuckoldry aspect to the character like mm. it's not book year on exactly but i think they are actually doing a better job with year on than i expected after mm. last season is book year on gonna start calling victorian a beta cuck <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> oh god <laughs> but so how about um Cersei's punishment of Ilaria. Mm. That was way worse than I thought it was going to be. Just in terms of like what's what it's going to do to her mentally. Like I thought they were mm. going to go full HBO and we we're going to see just every terrible thing they thought they get on screen. But yeah. just like the mental torture of watching Tyene die. That's next level horrible thing to do. I was so relieved it wasn't the mountain doing like a brutal. Yeah, I'm, they had him right I'm there. glad yeah. they did not go that route. I am yeah. very yeah, glad me too. they didn't do that. Yeah, it would have felt too much. Was the Walking Dead Negan episode mm. out by the time that they uh, shot this scene? Probably because not. in some aspects I, I felt like that was bleeding out into this episode, like that whole feeling of that. Um, but it just felt like they were they were extending the scene longer in the cut, yeah. or maybe it was in the editing, where they wanted to like milk it for all it's worth in some way, as long as they possibly could, the horror. But it didn't end on anything, uh, like you were saying, very bloody. Yeah. So It was just them trying to reach each other. Which, in some ways, is even more horrifying. Um, and apparently they're not coming back. Well, That's like the end of it. It technically... They could reach each other because they're chained up to the wall, but then at the very end of the scene, you see them, like, reach out. All they have to do is, like, kick their legs up, and they can uh, they can reach each other. If they could just play footsies, Aww. you know, and yeah. be content yeah. with that. Yeah, Only the that was enough. They have to do mid-air footsies. <laughs> Try and escape. <laughs> Houdini style. Over the next, like, one day or so, until Tyene dies, and then it's going to be terrible. Yeah. They brought this up in the History of Westeros live stream that apparently a bunch of people noticed that and I also noticed this too, being into makeup myself. Oh. That Lena Headey's lips were a slightly different color. Mm. Yes. And I was like, hmm, hmm, that's not a color that I would expect one to wear, you know, with that outfit. But, you know, you do you. <laughs> but, like, and in that lighting. But, yeah. It, and it doesn't really suit the aesthetic that Cersei goes for. It turns mm -hmm. out it's because there was poison. Turns the out. Lip yeah, I liked it. I noticed it as well. The very pink, like, mm. yeah. it looked like she had eaten five watermelons before <laughs> she went down to the crypts. It's just, Maybe she did. It just <laughs> clashes with the outfit and the scenario, in my opinion. <laughs> I agree. The The poison made me think of, because Kyburn would have, you know, had to, like, figure out, like, reverse engineer the poison of Alaris. It reminded me, way back in the day, in 2011, early in season one, <laughs> when you have that scene of Kat getting the blonde hair from the Winterfell Tower. I remember it being yeah. derided by a lot of early fans as, like, way too CSI and, like, Game of Thrones should never be like this. You know, it's like a crime procedural. And yeah. I miss that we didn't get, like, the typical techie sequence of, like, you know, reverse engineering <laughs> and working out, you know... <laughs> Or CSI yeah. style, the poison. Oh, yeah. That's cool. See, I thought I you were going to gonna say that, that you wanted to see a montage of him sort of like testing out different lipsticks to see which one was the... <laughs> oh, he just puts them on yeah. one sort by like, one. Um, <laughs> see who uh, dies. <laughs> like a Buffalo Bill style thing from Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I wanted to see a house shot of when when she kissed Tyeen, you got to zoom in and see the poison going down her throat and going to work. <laughs> oh. Like in Osmosis Jones. <laughs> Of course, whatever that yeah. is. You haven't seen Osmosis Jones? Wow. It's a classic. You're, you're it's an off. Oscar award it's winning movie. Directed by Mark Mylo. No, it's not. It's not directed by Mark Mylo. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't win Oscars, I think. I don't know. Yeah. The other thing, and I think 
Eliana, you might have pointed this out on Twitter as well, but um, Cersei taking down Ilaria and Tyene was really reminiscent of the Mad King executing Rickard yeah. And, yeah. and Brandon. And in fact, I, we might even be leading in the same thing here. In the books, obviously, Ares kills Rickard and Brandon and then is so aroused by this, he goes and has yeah. horrifying sex with his wife and conceives Danny. Cersei immediately goes to Jamie after she kills Tyene and tortures Ilaria and hooks up with Jamie. Like she, she's just so aroused by this situation. So some fun parallels there, some really fun uh family entertainment. So Cersei and Tyka? Yeah. Well, uh at the at the end of the scene though, Sub Commander Talek of the Tal Shiar shows up and announces that Gold Dumar has made it to uh to talk to her about the Cardassian <laughs> alliance that she wants to have incredible <laughs> that was deep cut the, the woman who comes to the door with the incredible haircut and the beautiful and the wonderful neckline um is she's been on the show since season two she was sansa's handmaiden who shay threatens mm-hmm. um when they when sansa has her period and and they're gonna burn the bedding and all that she was that handmaiden um she then became one of cersei's handmaidens and assisted her with dresses and stuff. Last season, she's the one who was helping her get dressed wet for the morning of the sept blowing up. Um, and uh, this is all credit to wow. Joanna Robinson at Vanity Fair, who yeah. put out a little article b- breaking all this down, all her appearances. The character's name is Bernadette, and I guess she got a haircut to match um, uh, her, oh. her mistresses. But but yes, yeah, she, she's been in the show since season two as a minor character. Yeah, I remember the character. I did not remember mm. though that that was her because she had. Yeah, she made black the new black, and then took it blacker, and then put scoffs to shame. <laughs> it's the pixie cut, you know. It it just it transforms the face. The Cersei cut. The Cersei cut. Yeah, that's now called the Cersei. She, she's mm. a manic Cersei dream girl. <laughs> I like that it like she's putting something in style. I guess mm. and seeing it reflected in other characters around her, like mm-hmm. maybe that's there aren't rights. And they're following their new queen. Sure. Because <laughs> now, now people, I don't know. Davos remarks when he meets with the Iron Bank earlier that Cersei is a queen whose people despise her. Yeah. And now people, I guess, like her well, a lot. one person who has changed her haircut to look like her. <laughs> but in this scene, she's just bringing news that Mark Gaddis has arrived on the set of Game of Thrones. <laughs> Without a beard, and I didn't recognize him. Yeah, sans beard. And was that like a nice collar that he had on? It, was, it looked very nice. Looks like he's uh, fresh from the Sherlock set. So it, it, the scene does implicate that the Iron Bank is connected to the slave trade. How does everyone feel about that? I don't think it implicates them directly. I think it implicates that they know the slave trade is down. He didn't say they have money in the slave trade. Cersei said that and he didn't correct her. But it's not the same as him admitting it. He's like a rules lawyer. Yeah. He is a ru- he's a banker. There are tertiary like other trades that are affected, and I'm willing to like believe that. And that can mm-hmm. be my new headcanon, because I just like I'm really not not feeling it. I'm just like not for the Iron Bank of Bravos like investing directly into the slave trade because it's just so antithetical Damn. to the whole point of Bravos. So I'm I'm willing to believe, of course, that they say that their profits are affected because all the trade would be yes. affected. Yeah, and exactly. this is something what exactly. you pointed out a couple like Cast ago in something else, uh, Aaron, but... In finance, there's something called the beta of a stock, which every stock has. But it's it's a ratio that, like, what a stock's propensity is to move with the market, because every single stock has this. A ratio of one moves, it means up. N- like, 5% of the stock market overall moves up, 5% it drops. Five, and then the ratio shrinks. Like, you can have stocks that have, like, uh, half of uh, 0. 0.5 so it moves like half and then you have stocks that move like double so basically everything is cyclically connected because they're investing in like insurance on ships and stuff and some of them are trading with marine and they go to marine and they're like oh we don't have anything to sell you now um because all the the workforce is gone and we're going through our own thing so yeah everything's totally connected and it's going to be affected because of the slave trade Rev- the point is that revolutionaries are not good for immediate business and that that is true yeah like it upsets cool. the economy and that was a big thing that uh danny had to deal with in marine because she didn't have an economic plan mm. to bring about the a uh, quick abrupt change to slavery so yes it's all connected uh, there's also a post on the sub follow about the money this. follow the money cersei is probably making good on what she said too because with 
the end of the episode and sacking High Garden and all that. She's got plenty of resources she can bring back, you know, in a good amount of yeah. time for him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She can trade That's gold true. for more gold. It makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's the best game, video game quest ever. It's a great one. Yes. Something I don't understand in this scene is when Tycho Nestoris compliments Cersei by saying truly like that she is Tywin come again. Mm. Is that meant to be just to flatter Cersei? I mean, obviously it yes. is. Or is the show actually trying to assert to us that oh. unlike book Cersei, that Cersei of the show is in fact competent and can be interpreted as being on par with Tywin in her strategy. Excellent. Question. I think it's the first one. I think I think that um everyone had the interpretation of this scene that Tycho was like won over by Cersei and like he was involved with Sage. I took it the other way, that he still wants to support Danny because he freed all the slaves and she's more likely to win, but he's playing Cersei, because that's what the Iron Bank does. He's buttering her up. He's going to take the money back and then do whatever he wants because she's not. She's nothing like Tywin. Is that the case in the show? Right. I. She blows up the set. Which he knows. But the meta thing that's been going on through the the season so far is they keep building up favorites and then knocking them down. They've done that with Danny so far. They've done that with yeah. Tyrion and and John. I think this is Cersei's turn. She's getting everything's going right for her right now, but it's all going to crash down. Be- Everything's coming up, Cersei. And I think that's, I think Tycho is being very misleading with her about what he actually wanted. So I don't. I mean, that happened I, with Tywin too. I would say I don't have enough faith in the show writers to not intend, for, for them to not intend that that's how we're supposed to read it, that she is literally Tywin come again. Like, I, I guess maybe just from watching too many inside the episode segments, <laughs> I yeah, feel like probably. they tend to write what they want us to think if that makes sense maybe it's a blessing that the official game of thrones channel has stopped listing the inside the episodes oh yeah honestly maybe I, it's a favor like, to other regions see i was waiting for you sam to open your mouth here and say well maybe this is meta commentary on the show trying to assert itself that the show is tie when coming it, 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 it has ne- not <laughs> ended a, a downturn like it's uh <laughs> it's great it's the show is george r, r. martin come again so, so are we saying the show is the Cersei to the books Tywin? <laughs> Maybe, I mean, like, because the Tywin we have in the books is in fact Tyrion. Tyrion is, in many ways, Tywin writ small and becomes much more cruel like Tywin. Maybe because Tyrion has been painted as Saint Tyrion in the show, we are supposed to be interpreting Cersei as that new Tywin. I don't know. Well, I mean, like, she... Her- the plan worked this episode like the Lannisters yeah. Yeah. they got high garden exactly. they've got a heap of resources so right I'm not That's I'm bagging on it yet yeah yeah exactly we thought, we thought Stannis' battle plans were bad in season 5 <laughs> they're making Stannis look like Genghis Khan compared yeah. to Tyrion right now mm. <laughs> at least Tyrion got I, his cool montage narration thing oh <laughs> yeah I did I did like that we'll get but to we'll, it we'll get to it yeah speaking of Stannis Baratheon we next move to the north, to Winterfell, where oh. Stannis Baratheon uh, died. And R.I.P. He did. We get a nice West Wing style, which I've definitely watched. That's a television show I have seen. Uh, West Wing style walk and talk. Liar! <laughs> West Wing style walk and talk with Sansa and Littlefinger as Sansa is she's noticing things that need to be done differently, storing food, stapling leather to breastplates or whatever Hmm. this is also where Littlefinger gives one of the many uh, Littlefinger trailer monologues Um, this one this was the one with fight every battle right yeah which is all the time a parody climb every mountain (laughs) just never stop fighting (laughs) what is the rest of that song that's what I thought of that was (laughs) exactly Michael Uh, Gessie we're drift compatible yeah (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I thought it was neat. I don't know if this fits more on the brand bit coming up after, actually, but how, how Littlefinger's lines very clearly connect with what Brand says, you know, five minutes later. I thought that was neat, and it's a very season seven, you know, look at these two things parallel, and let's get through yeah. the story quick kind of move. And I, yeah. it's, it's like the very, you know, pointed scene transitions we've had in the last two weeks as well. I like mm-hmm. this kind of new thing season seven's doing where it's really making its parallels known 
you know, very quickly, not subtly. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's, it's I do like that. Um, there was another fun bit of dialogue during the walk and talk in which they reference the very very pointedly reference Maester Lewin's letter records that he kept a record of every letter ever sent to or from Winterfell, mm-hmm. um, which opens up a whole treasure trove of potential MacGuffins to resurface. Um, the important part about that is not that just they mentioned that that little finger like did a head snap as soon as he said it. So little finger well, thinks what? there's something in those records that he cares about. Something that he didn't no. know was there. I propose it was the letter from Lysa uh, about how the how the Lannisters killed John Aaron and how it was a lie. And Sansa, if she actually saw that letter, would know it, it was a lie. One of the few people that would know that because she heard Lysa conf- uh, confess to it. But there's other mm. possibilities. Like it could be um, uh, letters to Rob. It could be something about maybe Rhaegar and Lyanna. I know in the books, Maester Lewin came to Winterfell after Robert's Rebellion, but they haven't yeah. established that in the show as far as I know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be something about Ned and Howland Reed. There's all sorts of interesting stuff that could mm-hmm. have come and gone from Winterfell in this time. Absolutely. Yeah. It could be Absolutely. more crayon drawings yeah. from Littlefinger, but instead of it being addressed <laughs> to Sansa, it's addressed to Cat. Oh my god. <laughs> Perfect. They do say they do say that Cat <laughs> received like at least like one more letter from Littlefinger and she never responded back to it. So yeah, I oh. think my crayon drawing theory. It is, that could yeah, be true. yeah. It's so nice of them to just conveniently sort of. I, it it is a good sort of end game kind of thing to do. Just like open up this treasure trove of like we could bring back any plot point we want now. Like Bran <laughs> shows up and you've yeah. got this treasure trove of letters. They can do anything they want now at Winterfell, basically. Um, that's true. It's like when you're playing a trading card game and then you get one of the cards that lets you reshuffle your deck and go into the card pile. And <laughs> they got all of it. Anything out. Exactly. I think they're going to use it as a fake out because I think Littlefinger is going to be like, oh, hey, I was the, the chief accountant at King's Landing. Let me help you look through those records. You got a lot to sort there. And then he like comes across it and he sees the copy of the letter. And that's a, like a reminder for the audience rather than putting it on like the before last on game of thrones last scene on game of thrones before the episode um and then he just burns the letter and it's like gone but then like sandor shows up or something and he lets everybody there's a promo picture i think from the next episode preview that shows sansa with a bunch of letters so it seems like she's gonna get her hands on them and well that's stupid (laughs) it's stupid okay (laughs) um someone said no in the writers room Somebody said no in the writer's room. Um, it's a show about characters. If you're going to have somebody bring information, it should be Sandor finding it out rather than a letter and piece of paper. Yeah. yeah, there's the stuff in the first season that could be a callback where Ned finds the black of hair moment in the, the ponderous tome. But at this juncture in the story, it's about the characters. And it should tie into that rather than being like a piece of paper in a book. Plus, that's that's Sam's arc. It could be a lot of things. It could be everything coming around Littlefinger at once. All these little things adding up to Sansa finally deciding he's not worth it anymore. That's true. It could be letters yeah. plus Bran plus... Plus Sandor, yeah. Sandor, I guess, yeah. She's exactly. now imagining every single every single battle, everywhere, fight, everything. Against him. Everywhere. In your head, always in your mind, under the sea, in the water, in the sky... I like how he added in your mind. Fight every battle everywhere, but just in your mind. Like don't actually don't be a crazy person. <laughs> uh. Maybe Sansa is I, I haven't seen this scene, so I have no idea what it looks like. I'm just gonna spitball some ideas out here. Go. She's sending yeah. letters to a bunch of people to enlist help from across the north, because remember, as Tywin Lannister said, not all battles are won on the field. Some of them are fought through ravens. Word. Straight up. There you go. Yeah. Speaking of ravens, that's a good segue. Oh. Bran shows up. Hey. Uh, this is hardly hey. the like tearful hug reunion we got, the hug that was promised last <laughs> season with Sansa and John. Um, Bran is like comically robotic in this episode. Yeah. User um, full force 098. Uh, made a great post about this which got many upvotes uh which they'll be able to cash in at the prize desk um the title is regarding why brand's acting so weird why did he say that he isn't well and doesn't know what he's saying and their argument is that um he has he wasn't trained properly to be the three-eyed raven because he messed up by letting the night king in too early 
and now he just has this overload of information in his head and he's like hmm. Aaron's computer trying to render a Maester monthly video just he's using all 32 <laughs> gigabytes right now um <laughs> Doma Regato Knights King Rabato. <laughs> um that being said uh, Brain uh, actually says that he says he's having like fragments and pieces of stuff hmm. he he doesn't he has all the information he doesn't know how to use it yet yeah which is a convenient storytelling way to to keep Bran from being too powerful yep. of a plot plot breaker. Baylor breaks spear, Brandon break plot. I miss when um, what's it's Isaac, isn't it Isaac? Yeah, Hempstead. When he was adorable. Yeah, I miss when he acted. Like I don't, I think he's a pretty good actor. So yeah, yeah. it's sad that he's just robot now. Hello, Sansa, mm-hmm. you look beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about your wedding night, huh? <laughs> God. <laughs> was it such a you beautiful on- wedding you guys were great what a beautiful wedding I think it was wedding. you also on Twitter Eliana you've been on fire for this episode that was me I, I got yeah. I got a lot of feelings yeah about how Brand like Jojen's the one you were saying right who's who's this like robot my frustration with this and I voiced this in like in a couple of areas like on Twitter like various chats is like <laughs> It feels wrong to me. Like, I understand the rationalization that perhaps Bran is acting thusly because he has an overload of information and doesn't know what to do with it. But in a story that's meant to be driven by characters, the way that they've handled Bran's storyline feels wrong. It's like they've grafted Jojen's personality onto yeah. Bran. Yeah. But, like, what we understand from what it means to be not necessarily the three-eyed raven, but like what we know about the three-eyed crow from the mm-hmm. books. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that you like have become an automaton and don't feel anything. Like the first encounter we ever have with the three-eyed crow is actually, you know, through Bran's dream before he comes awake again. And we have this crow, and he's like cracking jokes at Bran, and he's got a sense of humor, and it's kind of mm-hmm. teasing him. Yep. And that's a blood raven. And then when we finally meet blood raven, he talks about how he had a brother that he loved, a brother that he hated, and a sister that, a woman that he loved. And these Mm -hmm. aren't, these aren't nothing. These are feelings. These are actual emotions. And then when Bran is looking through the trees again and going through the past, he, it's like Bloodraven is empathizing with Bran and telling him, you're going to see your family. You're going to see all these moments. And it's sad. You're going to feel regret because you're going to try because Bloodraven, this means that throughout the years that Bloodraven was the three-eyed crow he had tried to reach through the past to change history and right. save his family save yeah. the people he loved and this is completely contrary to the image we get of bran because bran is like this little boy yeah and the way I, that i phrase is like bran has basically broken the most expensive vase in the entire world <laughs> he's completely messed up yeah on top of that all of his mistakes has led to his wolf dying has led to yeah. his mm-hmm. companion who supported mm-hmm. him this whole time dying and turns out he's the whole reason his companion was like that right yeah we're not getting any follow-up there we haven't gotten any follow-up there should be consequences for the way that bran feels about all that and it's not been addressed at all they've just hand waved it away as like bran's the three-eyed raven now he's gonna go plot dump so what you're <laughs> saying is his story now is too wooden oh yes. my god <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've got a I've got an in show theory that Euron has his magical aspect and he's both he's using Shade of the Evening now to sap into Brand's personality sap. and oh. taking everything. Sapping. There you wow. go. You're barking up yeah. the right tree. Sap. Yeah. Oh. I really like Eliana's point about Jojen's personality getting grafted on to Bran, because that plays really mm-hmm. well with a thread I really liked by Yezin IRL, uh, making a similar point about possibly the books resurrected unjohn will get this very, you know, dehumanized, uh, stilted robotic personality after coming back because mm. he'll be, you know, damaged and George says resurrection, blah, blah, blah. And that brand's got it because the show is doing so many character substitutions now. You know, it's giving characters in the oh. books might get these plots, but different characters in the show will be doing them. So I thought that was an interesting thing. Whatever's happening, brand's getting a personality that doesn't feel like brand's personality. It almost feels to me like how you were saying earlier, I think it was Matt was saying how Danny's like been handicapped. Like they're putting these, they're knocking these, these characters go up and then they're like knocking him down. Yeah. Kind of arbitrarily. Mm-hmm. Like all these stark reunions, Dean, they like too happy, too happy. We've got to 
you know, make it a yep. little bit sad, a little bit bittersweet somehow. Let's <laughs> exactly. make Bran a mindless robot. Have you tried turning Bran off and <laughs> on again? I think they did. <laughs> I was actually having room. I thought they um, watched Watchmen before they wrote that scene because he seems so oh, much like Dr. Manhattan Dr. now. Manhattan, yeah. Dr. Branhattan? Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> 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 he really does. He seems like he's on Mars. Yeah. Well, if A Song of Ice and Fire is in the Thousand Worlds universe, maybe Bran can it go to not. another planet and build up his, you know, Dr. Manhattan palace there. Oh, yeah, probably. I mean- in the comics, didn't Dr. Manhattan, he, like, had trouble relating to people and understanding, but he still had feelings. He's like, yeah, he I'm did. sad yeah, that I lost you, and now I whole- want to try making yeah. my own humans yeah. and, like, feel love, right. and yeah. the books were better. I think yeah. Bran still has that, but I think we're we're seeing that, I mean, he lost Hodor, he lost Summer, he lost the Three-Eyed Crow all at once, and he got dragged through the wilderness. I think he's, like... Just, like, shut himself down emotionally from all the trauma he's had recently. I do wonder if they're going to have a thing through the end of the show, like, through these last two seasons of Bran slowly becoming a little more human again. Like Arya. Human again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, maybe as the Starks coalesce, that they're going to sort of, Hmm. you know, heal a little bit. And Bran's obviously very damaged now, but, like, like maybe that's the direction they're going with it. I still kind of prefer him as, like, child Bran, but still. Hmm. Um. I agree. Speaking of crippling injuries that can ruin a person's life, we <laughs> next move on to Old Town, where um, Sir uh, nice. Sir Jorah Mormont has been completely cured overnight of grayscale. He just he slept it off, did a did a good juice cleanse, and <laughs> that was it. Yeah, and did his skincare routine. Yeah, did his yeah exfoliated. They gave him some noxzema. <laughs> uh-huh. They did do a a skin treatment. That's for sure. That's true. Yeah, uh, I think Sam just invented Clearasil. Actually, is what happened. <laughs> uh, Jorah's grayscale thing picks up in season five. It's this whole quest thing. We're three episodes in, and he's cured and sort of back to normal. Yeah, I, I don't know. It just it it feels like they wanted to give Sam and Jorah something to do at the start of the season, I guess, uh, and and just fill some time. I don't know. I, I, yeah, yeah. Where is Hearts? What are we talking about? Like the arcs that get dropped, like Jorah's grayscale getting kind of abruptly cured, and all the nonsense with Hearts I feel like that's kind of the trade-off when you're watching TV that's planned, you know, year to year, and then the next year they might change yeah. their mind and restructure things. But you get it every year, you know. The books, it's you know planned much, you know, larger scale, and things will fit together much more nicely, and there's not going to be nearly as many, if any, aborted arcs. But that takes a lot more time in massaging the narrative. I, I can't think of a good example of a, a book series that's taken a while to come out, but I'm sure one will come to my head. Um, Dark Tower had a gap for a yeah. while. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so it looks like, Jor- does Jorah know that Danny's at Dragonstone? I guess he does. Yes. I mean, he was asking about her in the first episode. I assume the Citadel must know that Danny has landed on Dragonstone by now. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then obviously he does not get kicked out of Hogwarts, but he also does not get... <laughs> Does not win the Triwizard Cup or whatever it's called. Uh, uh, such a bummer. That whatever. Triwizard that Cup. Yeah. Is. No, instead, Professor Slughorn obviously gives him a new menial task to do. Do we think it's actually a menial task, or is it Professor Slughorn giving mm. him the old wink, wink, and handing over a bunch of rare books? It's the wink, yes. wink. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Because otherwise, sure. what is Sam doing? <laughs> he's gonna look through all those manuscripts, and he's gonna find. He's gonna find one. He's gonna be like, Gilly, Gilly, look, I found. I found this really strange manuscript that tells us how things should have been. It's called The Winds of Winter. <laughs> <laughs> By George Martin? Who's that? I Actually, that okay. Genuinely, what do you think the odds are that when Sam is looking through these old books, they throw in some like line about, oh, and here's some like book about you know the longest winter there ever was called The Winds of Winter, and they like set that aside or something. It's going to be something like I that. I can see it. Uh, I'm just I saying. Or like, so. uh, I hope they do. Maybe like The Princess and yeah. the Queen's going to show up or... Something. The Rogue oh, Prince. Yeah. Prince. Yeah. yeah, the Rogue Actually, Prince. I could see Gil Dane. My guess, yeah. my blind guess is that uh, the mace, Arch Mace was going to, uh-huh. like Sam's going to be like, where'd all these come from? And it's like, oh, they were checked out by Rhaegar Targaryen years oh, ago, and yeah. uh, we just haven't gotten around to right. it. Yeah, we got a lot of overdue like books. Yeah. 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 It's got to be sort of plot plot related like that, because we're almost- Cersei returned Cersei him. Cersei returned. <laughs> um Found him when she was in the crypts with the scorpion. She's like, oh, look, we got to... These are overdue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, back, geez, yeah. He's back to Blockbuster. 
return um, these so we don't have to pay the book fees. Because we're almost we're almost halfway through the season, and so far Sam has uh, affected plots, but hasn't actually had like his own arc. He's he's got the dragon glass thing, and he's got Jora, but he's basically just yeah. shooting people at Dragonstone. He's not actually doing anything. He's actually de-infected plots. Mm. <laughs> Right. True. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. But yeah, so I mean, it, it, the books have to be his thing now. I think, right? We've had these sort of two tangents that he's gone on, but it's like his superpower, time. where if he does something he reads in a book, it always works out. Yeah. It, it's like it's the weirdest superpower I've ever heard of. Like Ebros asks him about that. He's like, how? He's like, how did this work? And he's like, I don't know. I followed the instructions. So like how Danny can't be burned. He's just going to do that forever. He's just going to read all these crazy instruction manuals and make everything happen correctly. Exactly. I still can't believe that worked. This is a dangerous procedure. There's yeah. a part of me that still thinks <laughs> yeah. that he's in remission and that it's all going to like blow up later. Everybody's going to agree scale. They did, Nate, they did drop that. Ebro said like you could have destroyed the entire Citadel. Yeah, I like that part. I think he should have used Heartsbane or something more unique, like awkwardly cutting him with a giant <laughs> great sword. And it's like, oh, it turns out this is what did it. If only I had a Valyrian steel knife instead. Da, 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 da. Like this one in the book that I, yeah, showing it off. <laughs> anyway, yeah, like this one. He holds it up and shows it in the camera. Yeah. He's like been drawing, he's highlighting yeah. it <laughs> with like a little highlighter. <laughs> Speaking of things that were um, better in the books, uh, Casterly Rock. And High Garden. <laughs> well, we don't know. We don't have the books, but I assume it's better. Yeah, I assume High Garden doesn't look like a small castle with like three towers mm -hmm. on the top of it. That was like the they like found a, a C D grade castle and just like put it up at the top and they're like this is High Garden. I was like really? I assume they're actually gardens. Couldn't get a better matte painting. <laughs> there was someone on, I I can't remember who it was on Twitter, but they they had like you know the thing you order online and it's the picture of High Garden from the World Wars and Fire <laughs> and then what arrives on your doorstep and it's the uh, <laughs> the picture from the show. Um, speaking of sneaking around the back. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, speaking of Bran and Hodor, because uh, it's the Hodor, oh, Tyrion sends the Unsullied geez. in through his... Oh. Yeah. The taking of Casterly Rock is depicted almost like Yara's invasion of the Dreadfort, right? Or is it the invasion of the Dreadfort? Anyway, where we have... It's one of the only times in the show where we have a character monologuing over a montage of them doing something. Yeah. I, it was very Guy Ritchie, very modern. I thought it was a fun thing yeah. to do for the show. I'm really liking that there was that sam montage and you know like they, they've really played mm. with stuff a lot more um which i like yeah it's good yeah <laughs> wow yep so yeah gray worm he storms the castle and he looks out and you're on like he took out his wind waker and played the ballad of the gales mm -hmm. and selected do you wish to warp to pike and he said yes and he popped in and just swam down that happened in sunk. the same day so they were only a day behind and they didn't look backwards and be like hey there's some ships following us <laughs> There have been a lot of posts about um, has, does Danny have a mole in her council? And I think it's implied in the scene that she doesn't because Tyrion says, uh, like, Cersei will know we're coming. Mm -hmm. So it kind of undercuts that. They just want it to be like, Cersei's going to know. If you really because wanted to check if Danny had a mole, you'd have to go back to some of the season one scenes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. oh, I get it. Uh, Jesus. They explained away the mole thing uh, later when Jamie said that it was his plan. That he decided to leave Cashley Lock like like that mm -hmm. on purpose. You gotta admit, I don't really. Uh, people have been complaining, obviously, about the you know you're on pe people warping around this episode, things like that. Um, but that doesn't hasn't really bothered me as much. We did bring it up in one of the past two episodes that like Danny doesn't have any escorting ships, so it makes sense to me that the Unsullied would get attacked now because she doesn't have the Iron Fleet with him. So yeah. they're very vulnerable. Yeah. That makes sense in the context of the show. Right. That plot is set up. Explain away the logistics. So I'm not, uh, you know, they, they don't need to do it themselves mm -hmm. on screen. That would just be a waste of time at this point. And they do have a, di a directing decision to uh, to walk through Highgarden, just tailing Jamie as he walks through, which I think is, is fine. I, to, yeah, I liked that. To like show it that way. We'll know what happened to the Tyrell army. Oy. That just... I have strong negative feelings about uh, High Garden. Did she forget to pay her cable bill? She 
She's re- she needs Masande there to be like, I heard you forgot to pay your cave, pay your army. So they just disbanded. <laughs> they went home. They focused pretty hard on Randall Tarly when they were walking up to High Garden. I was wondering if they were try- kind of implying that Randall broke it from the inside and they just didn't talk about it for some reason. Like he had like he had some of his mm-hmm. men inside and they did essentially what Grey Worm did to Casually Rock. They just they did it to High Garden. I, I think that has to be sort well, of there's the no, implication. There's, well, I know they don't not, say not, it. Not but. like the not necessarily even the, the way Grey Worm did, but just the implication of like, ah, uh, the Tarleys are there, so yeah, that means betrayers. the Tar- the Tarleys are alone uh, the Tyrells are alone and they have no friends and they're gonna lose. Like just the, the having him in that shot was them trying to say Look, yeah. the Reach doesn't support the Tyrells anymore. They're alone. That's true. Which, I don't know if that worked, but I, I think trying, that's what they were trying to do. I was trying to, to headcanon it. <laughs> yeah. In that, there's no real narrative conclusion to Olena's end. It's just kind of like they lopped her off because she's no longer necessary, where it didn't feel very Game of Thrones-like. They didn't sell the build-up with Tarly turning on Elena and like the stuff with Mace Tyrell, and they, maybe they should have kept Mace around, maybe even more so than Elena, to have the the Tyrells come to a conclusion here because they actually have more of a a feud between characters that stretches back a long time. Otherwise, it's just like Elena's demise is that she wasn't as brutal as Cersei was so I don't know exactly what you're trying to say here I liked it a lot um Olena's death scene and mm. I I don't know I I think it just felt like a nice way to tie off an episode that's all about um sort of and especially in a season that's all about plot threads coming home to roost and things like that and it's Olena, who's like the last survivor of this plot thread that was so important for a while, and she's she's just like like the episode ends with her just like small and alone and dark in a room by herself. Like it's I, I don't know. I, I found that to be that final shot of her to be just as as interesting as maybe not just as interesting, but compelling in mm. the same way the Theon shot of him alone in the dark is um from That's season true. two uh just her sort of dwindling and small and and it's yeah i thought their end scene was fine i just felt like there were but there's no narrative build up to it at all with her she like is in dragonstone she's opposing danny and then it's just like she pops back in to just get to just get killed like there's nothing there's no story there behind what she did to turn on cersei that caused her collapse like I felt like I was watching an entire season of episodes with a Tyrell arc in like five minutes, and I got nothing in between. Like there was a whole section I guess of I can the see story that, yeah. that I mean, did I, not appear. I don't, I don't know. I I thought that worked for them. I guess uh, I that that sort of ugliness and and smallness of just like this is this is how it ends for the Tyrells. I I kind of thought it worked. They also used it more to inform Jamie's plot. Because he got roughed up so much this episode by so many different characters, <laughs> yeah, that, like they're using this to break him even more. Yeah. So in the, I mean, the Tyrell <laughs> plotline was more or less over. I mean, Olena said that herself that like she didn't have any like heirs left. It was just her. I guess how else are you gonna finish it? Olena's gonna die somehow. At least they use it to further a different plot. I guess it's more you're trying to sell this thing about Tarly turning on Olena, but there's a sum total of zero scenes in the show between any. Tyrell and Randall Tarley and they have t- had time to do it. I'll take it and it's not the like that she has made a mistake and there was a recent post um that just appeared on the sub about this missing the point and rewarding a moral ruthlessness by user Derosties in which they say that the show they liked what they liked about the early show and the the books is that characters make mistakes and they end up paying the punishment for them and it's a story about people in that regard. And it just felt like Olena didn't really make any kind of narrative mistakes here to warrant her demise. I mean, like, just siding with Danny, the most powerful conqueror, is not, like, a, a narrative reason. I, Poisoning Joffrey many seasons ago doesn't really come off as a narrative reason. I super disagree, though, that characters need to have that sort of punishment need to die because of that sort of punishment in a story it worked on different levels than that it, you know it's it's they talk about the sword widow's wail and it's about you know her being alone and and the last of the tyrells and all that and it's 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 mm. not 
necessarily about her like making a mistake that she's then punished for. It's about in the series, in the sense that it was about the game. It was about the Game of Thrones. It was about this sad old woman who spent her whole life like pushing and, and you know trying to play the Game of Thrones, and in the end, like you know, she just lost. Just yeah. she just lost. Yeah, and and yeah, that's it has to deal with the writing in the last scene, which overall is very good, but. I'm talking about the build-up to it. They spent so many scenes last year with the Jonathan Price stuff and Marjorie, and that had a build-up to it. And I'd even say that went on a bit too long. They didn't need to do all those scenes. But this season, it's like there's nothing. It's like you go from Ned Stark traveling to King's Landing to immediately showing up and like he gets immediately beheaded. And it's like, where's where's the story? Like, where's the meat? Where's where's the beef? She, I mean, she says the thing about she wasn't as brutal as Cersei, but I, I don't know if I can take that face value What about punishment it's like so that forbes article that we've been passed around by eric kane entitled this is what worries me about game of thrones after last night's episode and this was referring to season seven episode two last week actually Mm -hmm. and eventually my computer's gonna let me scroll down Mm. um Mm. but the difficulty (laughs) that he has is it's not about the punishment it's that characters make choices and regardless of whether like it's good or not the bad things that happen, such as death, are because of consequences. And they talk about how, you know, Ned Stark didn't die because of anything random. It's because he was too stubborn and honorable to seize power. And he wanted to give Cersei's children a chance. And that was the choice that he made. And it's not that he should be punished for that. But the consequence of that choice that he made is that he died. And it just felt like... Elena dying and the way that he phrases it here is like it just feels like I can tell that it's a choice the writers made because they need to do the thing where they up the stakes for the quote-unquote good guys um over at Dragonstone and it lifts the curtain and I can see the strings being pulled of the puppets and because of that it just sort of ruins breaks my suspension of disbelief of the story because of that. Well, if you're comparing Olena to Ned, it's it's much more drawn out. But this is the result of her taking House Tyrell to prop up the Lannisters in the wake of Robert's death. She chose to um, to really ally themselves with them when they didn't have to. And this is kind of the consequences of that. She made a devil's bargain with people that are immoral, brutal, and care about no one but themselves and this is kind of what happens she did she did make that choice mace tyrell did well it's always been implied that mace is sort of being bullied by his mother the whole time that she's she's the real brains behind the organization olena says that this is mace's idea because he's trying to like marry marjorie off to a bunch of people and i think that's it mostly in the books but i just like it's not necessarily just ned it's like a bunch of the the author gives a bunch of different examples. It is just feels contrived. The way season two of True Detective felt contrived. <laughs> I guess it felt hollow would be a word to describe how I felt sure. about it. Mm-hmm. I, I see what you mean. I mean, I, I will say I don't necessarily think the writers uh, intended for what I'm reading in that scene. But yeah, like, like I... I it's definitely just them checking off boxes for the end game, right? It's a hundred percent just them saying, "Okay, High Garden's gone, Olena's gone. Okay, we're you know we can wrap those up now." I kind of thought that. Um, I see what you guys are saying that it would have been better before this if we saw Olena do something instead of just like teleport, like you said, from Dragonstone to High Garden. But in more more recently than the decision to marry Tyrell and Lannister together, it was. It's coming home to roost what she said to Cersei, where she insulted her really badly that one time. Right, I think it was the end of near the end of last season. Where is this kind of like, all right, well, this is what happens when you piss off Cersei and she gains power. But I, yeah, I agree though that there should have been something intervening that Tyrell's doing something to really make this happen right now. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm. Elena never felt like a central enough character to me that I would dive into the thematics of it so much. So I'm just kind of chewing over everything that's been said. It's very fascinating. I, I agree. I agree with Michael. It feels like narrative, you know, chopping down, mm. uh, and I think that's a good thing. I think there's a certain joy in just feeling a narrative contract like that. That's actually one reason I was kind of annoyed with um when Mel said she's going back to Volantis or something. I had this great fear. Oh God, 
you know, we're not going back to Essos, are we? Because I'm enjoying <laughs> <laughs> Elena dying and the narrative, you know, getting smaller. But right, I think sure. yeah. uh, Aaron's points on the thematic issues of it are sound, yeah, for sure. I think you just need maybe four or five scenes, maybe an extra extended to eight episodes for the season. I think they truncated it too quickly to just bring it down. I guess she's not a central character. She's a side character. But the Tyrells have played such a big part that it seems somewhat weak that this is just the way that they go out. I mean, the scene itself is strong. And Olena has her her Ozymandias moment where she says, I killed Jane. <laughs> but maybe three, four scenes building up. And they could do that because they decide to introduce Randall Tarley as his own character. So in and, and Dickon and the stuff, and they could have they could have put in a couple more scenes with Tarly talking to Mace like last season because they knew that they were going to do this stuff, and they could have like built the Battle of Ashford thing up as like a thing, and maybe Mace didn't want to take credit for it, but Elena like push it like we have to maintain a strong image of our house, so just go ahead and push this like. Th- but it's kind of like the Boltons arc entirely with the Starks with what the Tarleys did, but it's all. It's thrown quickly. I don't think that they need to drag it out for a long period of time, but give it its just due as having... Let it breathe think, a little. Yeah. For, for me, at least, you know, and this might be wrong, you know, I'm thinking about it because these are a lot of good points and the Tyrells have definitely been prominent so far, but I felt, for me, like the Tyrell story kind of died in the season six finale when its most yeah. prominent characters, True. you know, Marjorie and Loris mm. died. And, so, you know, for me, I just kind of checked out after that and this was like an epilogue. But then again... You know, yeah. the Tyrell stuff has been pretty important so far in Season 7, which makes me think maybe you're right and it did deserve more of an actual ending here and not just like an afterthought. But yeah, I guess, I guess it depends. Like, geopolitically, the Tyrells and the Reach is still really important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and even in all <laughs> other plot lines, like Cersei and the Bank and everything. But I just kind of, like, Marjorie was my thing, you know, and, and Lois. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, oh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have checked out so hard. Oh, but, oh, well. <laughs> oh my! Well, right, uh, absolutely, Loris too. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> Mace was my thing. Um, uh, <laughs> if you're checking for moles and birthmarks, I mean, uh, he's got one that looks like the shape of Dorn up on so his, his inner thigh. Yeah, I've seen it. Um, I, I, <laughs> he should have. Should he get that check? Um, yeah, it's probably. Good. The Citadel won't do anything about it. <laughs> this, yeah, the treatment's too risky. Yeah, it's heart's pain to <laughs> cut it off. It also doesn't help uh, trying to sort of look at the scene, at the scene and the Tyrell story and all that when, in the inside the episode, D and D go well. You know, the the Tyrell soldiers are terrible, so they just lose the Battle of Highgarden off screen. Yeah. Uh, like, it, it's, it's like they say that, and you're like, oh, oh yeah. my god, like, sorry, that infuriates me. Oh. This is why you'd want to do the Randall thing. Did they look at the Tyrell <laughs> sigil and be like, it was, it's a flower, so right. they must be bad? That's the thing. At fighting. It's like, what, like, was that their was that their mentality? Did they look at the rest of the Eliana series they just produced of like? Yeah, it's like what Eliana was saying about the Tywin line with Tycho. Like, are we supposed to take Olena's thing about flowers being weak at? face value that that's what the show is telling us that i guess because they're flowers so. they're weak like <laughs> were we i mean it's just like did they look at the rest of the show that they just produced the tyrell army not just randall tarley's army the tyrell army made renly yeah. baratheon a serious yep. contender for the iron throne the tyrell army won the battle of the blackwater hmm. for the lannisters like they are not which weak named- which gets hmm. name dropped in this episode several times yeah, the Lannisters almost lost mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. if the Tyrells hadn't backed them up. And and last season, they had the Tyrell army marching on the Sept of Baelor, like this huge, impressive military yeah. with oh, this yeah. great hat. parade with Mace Tyrell at the head That's with right. this yeah. flowery thing. I mean, that, that was season six. That was like a year ago. <laughs> exactly. And those soldiers- yeah. And it's well regarded in the books that the- the Tyrells yeah. have like the largest army. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Right? That's, mm-hmm. And yeah. It, it just bothers me because like, it just goes against the entire mythology that they've established throughout the entire series. Like as right. another mod, Brian Bar- Baratheon says, there's just already so much detail in these families and these regions and stuff that you can't just like go and throw something in there like that and pretend that it's fine because it's already been established multiple times that the Tyrell army is a formidable force. Yeah, that's like the whole reason they're in this story. <laughs> yeah, show the stuff of Tarly like coercing people over to his side because he's won like more support from the 
from the soldiers than mm. the mm-hmm. Tyrells have. Show that like he's a martial guy and Mace is not. He has his flower plume. He didn't win that battle at Ashford. It was Tarly who won it. And I so guess show that yeah. worked really well. Right. Yeah. I guess the implication is that that's what happened off camera, but. Mm. I mean, it, you have to balance what you show and what you sort of imply, and at some point, you you do need to show some of some of the story happening. Otherwise, you you get to the end point, and you're like, whoa, wait, yeah. what the hell? Like, what happened in the middle here? Because that's not the story that happens off camera. Because they just said like they're just it's not our forte. Well, yeah, fighting's but... not our thing. Or they could have like at least shown if they weren't going to show Tarly treating with all the other lords and winning them over. All we saw going into this battle was. <laughs> Jamie Lannister with like four generals behind him, right? It was like Dickon, yep. maybe, and Tarly uh, and Braun, Braun and yep. and like that's it. If we if they wanted, they could have had that front line and then shown like a bunch of other banners. Yes. And shown all the yeah. sigils <laughs> of all of the other yeah. houses in the reach of backing them and all those other houses that we saw in the throne room, in the Iron Throne yeah. Room. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. then I would have been like, oh. all right, that makes yeah. sense because then the whole strength of the Tyrell army didn't fall behind them. It wasn't just one house. It was all the houses. That's a great, mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Banded together mm-hmm. to depose them. You're absolutely right. Yeah, all you have to do in that scene with with Jamie and uh, with Randall, Jamie some, say some line about like, the Lords of the Reach, they don't follow Mace Tyrell. He wasn't a battlefield commander. And like, you're the one who won Ashford against everybody. You talk to them. They follow your lead. And then at the end of that scene, Tarly like just walks into a room with those same Lords again. You can see like they have the Horn of Plenty of the Merry Weathers on their chest and they have a whole bunch of other different banners just in that room. And Tarly like looks at them and then and just like looks them over and then the camera cuts and yeah. it's implied that he's going to take the lead of all these houses now. Mm. That's all you have to do, but it's not Also in the bring in an actor for a one or two off scene playing Leighton Hightower down in the Citadel who like comes in while Sam's studying books or or give it to Gilly who has like nothing to do down right now in in Old Town. Like have her be outside like gathering some food up or something. You see the Hightower army mustering to get ready to go off and she like talks to some random a person in the market and she's like what the heck is going on it's like those are the high towers and she's like who are the high towers and and the person's like they're the third most powerful house in the reach there's gonna be a battle and gilly's like uh-oh and the audience is like uh-oh where who yeah what? A, lot. a lot uh, yeah i love the idea of the line of banners at the like, like just the line of generals at the front and honestly mm. the cg army marching on high garden looked really unimpressive it was like fewer guys than Stannis had in in that shot from when Stannis gets <laughs> defeated. Yeah. Like they they couldn't have, they couldn't have splurged and added just like this overwhelming force of <laughs> banners and you know, cavalry and all that kind of stuff. Just something to show us like, oh wow, that's a control horde. C. Yeah. <laughs> I, control C, Control V. Just copy copy more of the army. Over. Like make it look a little worse and I, have uh, more guys. <laughs> I like the scene. I, I did like the the scene between Jamie and Olena. Mm. But rather than making it about, like, I guess flowers were always weak, it could have been, mm. we can do more callbacks, and we can have a callback to maybe Varys' riddle of where does power reside, and that, and being about Randall Tarly and all the Houses of the Reach call, calling for right. the Iron Throne. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, I was thinking, yeah. uh, part of the reason they didn't do this is because obviously they didn't have time, but you know when they did have time? When they had Sam stop by the Tarly estate. They could have had him talk about Mace the whole time he was there. Instead of about Wild the Ashford, Wings? The Battle of Arashford. Mm, yeah. yeah. Instead of making it a racist thing, <laughs> use that productively since you know you're going to have Randall turn on them eventually. Yeah, the whole purpose of that scene now in retrospect was to make Randall Tarly into like a racist against the Dothraki and Wildlings later for this to cause him to turn Cloak. You could have just done the same thing with his animosity towards Mace in this moment and that would have been a thing between characters in a character drama so why not have it do why not do it there that's the perfect time in his house where he would brag about that duck <laughs> goose talk about um just quickly the the importance of taking high garden for cersei as like a tactical move oh so yeah. not only does she yeah, get sure. the money to take to pay off tycho nestoris that's the implication she's going to loot high garden um they also dropped earlier in this episode that dragonstone and winterfell are both thinking about their food stores and winter is coming mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Cersei just took the bread basket of Westeros. She took all the grain. She's going to take it back to King's Landing or Casterly Rock 
like Jamie laid it out in the first episode that Cersei's in a lot of trouble. Why are people going to follow her? Mm-hmm. Well, this might be why, because she will be the only one with bread and the only yeah. one with gold as winter starts falling south of the neck. Yeah, High Garden is hugely it's, important. You're right. And the and all those lands. And Jamie kind of pointed this out where Kashilak isn't really that important in terms of their battle plans. He's like, yeah, we'll take it back later after after we win the war. High Garden's the real prize. And it's sort of exposed yeah. in a way how Jamie is outthinking Tyrion on the battlefield. That like Tyrion's character traits well no that Tyrion's inexperience in being a general and being on actual battlefields outside of blackwater is being exploited by jamie at the moment that he actually has the tactical decision making that uh Tyrion lacks at this moment where his skills are mostly politics like how we did yeah. um mm-hmm. like how jamie calls back to because he has that experience he can learn from his mistakes yeah as, yeah as they point out yeah and other people with that callback to the Whispering Wood, which I liked. Mm-hmm. I liked that. I loved that. Callback. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you look at Danny's, her allies, a lot of them are sort of amateurs at what they're doing. Like, Alaria just became the leader of Dorne. <laughs> Olena's never led uh, an army, neither has Tyrion. Uh, Yara's done a lot of raiding, but she was, ne- she was not a focal point of the Greyjoy Rebellion. Right. Neither was Theon. She really has dragons and a bunch of people who think they can be conquerors whereas on cersei's side with randall tarley and jamie and the iron bank well supposedly the iron bank she has a lot of experienced commanders and resources to pull on that danny really doesn't well and and she's spending her her experienced commanders like the unsullied go to casterly rock they're not you know yeah the main part of the invasion and the dothraki are still sitting on dragonstone when they're arguably the most dangerous force the, the most dangerous like army component of her army mm-hmm second to the dragons because they're just so you know brutal and it's a horde and ruthless and all that kind of stuff so yeah i mean and i know that that's that's Tyrion's plan and all to spare bloodshed and good pr and all that but it is definitely the writers also sort of putting the harrison bergeron putting the harrison bergeron chains oh. on danny to sort of gimp her a little bit um mm-hmm. and make the story a little more interesting how's that how's that for a shout out <laughs> If I'm a Dothraki co right now, I'm rethinking my uh, my allegiance to Danny. Yeah, are they just farming now? Like, <laughs> yeah, like like I'm sitting on this island. I cross this sea. I'm not doing anything, and we're losing the war. And it's like, uh, I guess <laughs> yeah. she can. She's unburnt, but is this really where I want to risk my life? Yeah, maybe she should set herself on fire again. I don't think they'll have, they'll touch on that at all. But yeah, Team Danny's looking pretty rough. She is yet to win a single battle really which is what I she mean, says in the trailer in westeros she's in westeros yeah. in a single yeah. battle in westeros westeros true yeah she needs well, her signature she should... victory she needs jorah she should have brought dario she... dario was she should have yeah. brought dario and no people dario him, but he knew also could you imagine dario and john interacting that would be really fun uh, how would you oh, tell them apart <laughs> they look exactly the uncle same. benjen <laughs> yeah <laughs> ben dario yeah and the... <laughs> Like he walks into the room and Yara and Theon and John all look at him and they're like, wait a second. Yaron? <laughs> That's actually why he's not in this season. Do you think they could do a I need more help scene and there is a cut and immediately Daria warps over to Dragonstone and re-shows back up into the story? Perfect. No, because he, wasn't he filming Orphan Black? I don't know the last season, but that's most likely know. what he was doing. Michael, who is I have no idea. Yeah. Why not get Why not get Dario one point back? If Dario two is busy, <laughs> that'd be pretty funny. That's right. We get Ed Screen back, or whatever his name. Yeah. Ed Screen. <laughs> he was a good Dario, actually. Um, yeah, I he think was... he really captured yeah. what we were supposed to feel about Dario. Yes, yeah, he's a Michael Huisman yes. was too likable. Yes, Michael yeah. Huisman's like a nice <laughs> swell guy. Anyway, we uh. To, to wrap it up, we have mentioned all the callbacks this episode, and uh, user Johnny, uh, that's Johnny with two <laughs> H's, two Johnny. N's, and two Y's. Johnny. Uh, here he comes. His his flair is um, the Night of the Laughing Tree, and it says, keep laughing. Uh, made a post called, the last episode was full of references, callbacks, and name dropping, so I thought to record them all, and it is a nice little catalog of... Um, all the different, you know, callbacks and references and stuff in this episode. Because honestly, they are they are flooding us with callbacks at this point. 
Yeah. Um, it's I like it. Yeah. I like the flooding yeah. as a callback. That's how it should be at the end of a story. Except for the part where they don't call back how strong the entire army is. But yeah. yeah. It, f- it feels validating to have dedicated, you know, 60 hours of your life to a show for the show to say, hey. Exactly. You did good. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks for watching. You did good, kid. <laughs> uh well, I think that about wraps it up, unless you guys have anything else to... I thought it was the best Tyrion episode scripted since probably season three. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the lines that he has feel very, very Tyrion-like, and I don't think that they did this in the writer's room, but the fact that Tyrion is immediately capturing, going for Casterly Rock, it feels like maybe pers- his personality, he's feeling more of a high right now, and more positive, whereas before he's always been more bleak and dour so maybe Mm, he's like anticipating hey i'm finally gonna take casterly rock back from cersei and it's gonna be mine and he's feeling a bit more upbeat so i don't know if this will last if they're writing that into his personality but Mm -hmm. his stuff about the brooding felt very like Tyrion teasing people from earlier seasons which we haven't had a lot of yeah yeah for a long time i should Littlefinger have gone to Dragonstone instead of John? I think it would make more sense in the story uh, because yeah. it, he's always been this character who wants to have his hands yeah. in every cookie jar because mm. he warps back to go talk to Cersei <laughs> about. Um, I'm gonna touch you. <laughs> I'm gonna touch you. Yeah, like him. Him sizing up Danny seems like yeah. There's a new player. Yes. She might be stronger than all these other players. I need to size her up more than anybody. But he just decides to stay back and. And poke the bear in Winterfell. Touch other people. Yeah. I don't know why he's so keen on staying there when Sansa is like sassing back to him and, you know, John doesn't like him at all. Like, you'd think he'd jump on the opportunity to, you know, find he a He wants new host the good political power, but he needs the bad uh, relationship. Sansa? No. <laughs> needs a bad Sansa. And if Littlefinger went to Dragonstone, then we can have more Littlefinger berries. Uh, yes. Yeah. Those are some of the best call, b- and they haven't met, met each other since like season three or Girl. season two. I mean, it was such a big buildup, even in the show, in season one more so than the books, because you can't have a point of view in that aspect. But you have these scenes where they're building as like these two big heads that are building for this long climax as these players, and now you don't. But. You just like drop it, but without but you have an opportunity to bring that back. But without Littlefinger in Winterfell, there's like zero tension there. there there's nothing interesting in that yeah, plot, in, in the sense that there's this nothing spurring Sansa yeah. right to take over or anything like that. You know, it's just people who like each other talking to each other, and the show cannot have that. Yeah, it absolutely cannot have uh, just people getting along with no tension. <laughs> <laughs> and also, like in the universe, I don't think there's any chance that Sansa and John trust the little finger to go speak on their behalf to anybody. It's a good point. And yeah. even in the books, Littlefinger and Varys aren't by each other, but we can still see them pulling the strings to be rivals in terms of whatever they're trying to do with the game of Westeros. And I don't think they necessarily need to interact with one another, even though those were great scenes. Mm -hmm. for us to understand them as rivals right see their players on the game board they don't have to literally be fist fighting to see see the game being played out um what would that um, fist fight look like Ooh, it'd be a slap fight yeah Yeah. it would be a slap fight and we would put a stop to it because there are no slap fights allowed in slash r slash (laughs) a song of ice and fire please see our warning civility rule in the sidebar yeah (laughs) I think I would have rather liked to see Sansa and Danny. Sanny. Yeah, I think I I would that makes also sense to me. Like to see- Sansa and Tyrion Sansa meeting again would have been interesting. Oh yeah. yeah, that would have been an interesting meeting. You just don't have to have any uh, like shots of Winterfell other than Jon and Bran reuniting. Like that's all you have to do. It comes back to the tension because now Bran can't tell Jon his parentage, and Jon is meeting that we have ice and fire together like i mean i I, i'm not disagreeing with you i'm just like the the showrunners are clearly never going to do that because you know it's so much more fun for them to do the oh let's let's not have bran and john talk to each other and let's have john you know 
all that kind of stuff. Well, you just have him keep downloading because he's already downloading. And John's like, uh, should I poke him? He's like, Mira's like, no, 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 don't poke him. You can't, you can't turn the power off. He needs to install his updates. Um, I think we've said all there is to be said. We, uh, we did about two minutes of commentary for every one minute of um, episode. So that's pretty good. Oh, uh, what would you rate this episode on a grade from A to C minus? <sighs> <laughs> um, you know what? I would call it a B plus. I thought this was the best one of this season so far. I liked it. Yep. I'll give it a B. Mm. I give it an A minus. But I, I like the. I liked what I saw. <laughs> I enjoyed the actual episode. I get you. Yeah, yeah. I did walk away from it going, oh yeah, that was a good hour of television. Hour and nine minutes. A plus. I'm gonna give it an A. Oh. What? I'm gonna give it an A on the curve because I think it's the best we're gonna get this season. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, but oh, unweighted. 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 On the curve. What would Un- you give yeah. it? Unweighted. unweighted. Uh, um, yeah, compared to great television episodes from other shows. Oh, you can't ask us that. <laughs> well, no, I'm saying like an objective uh, rating as opposed to a Game of Thrones season seven. It loses. It loses a lot of apples by the the conclusion to the Tyrells to me. Apples. Everything else was fine. I've never heard this idiom before. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> well, it loses its A. It loses uh, some apples. It sounds like some sort of like folksy <laughs> saying, like, "Oh, there, it, I've got." It sounds I've like got a kid apples <laughs> again. Like it's. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like, is this another thing my immigrant parents never taught me? <laughs> We're flirting with coconut territory right now, hmm. right? but I think. Uh... <laughs> what. <laughs> As opposed to dingo territory. <laughs> I think maybe B minus. Yeah. All right, I was well, just trying to not be right, a hater. Ne- this is Gascari territory. Next week, could our dingo. rating system be a rating of apple to dingo? <laughs> I think- would you rate it pineapple pizza or no pineapple pizza, depending on who you are? I, I would raise it to cheese pizza. I think I think a cheese pizza is a pretty good rating for it because it felt hollow to me. So ah. like it just has no toppings. But, but still, but still good. pizza. Yeah, still right, pizza. Still you p- yeah. would still right. eat that. It's mm. basically breadsticks with marinara. <laughs> Wait, whoa, whoa! You just changed. You just moved that goalpost real far. You went from pizza to breadsticks and marinara. What is it? Those are but different. But that's what things. cheese pizza is. Yeah, but one cheese pizza is breadsticks with. Actually, it's a sandwich. It's just an open face sandwich. Yeah, it's an open calzone. If they were the same thing, I wouldn't be paying extra at Pizza Hut for my breadsticks. Is cheese pizza really breadsticks with marinara sauce? No, wrong Next band. Uh, tune in. Put that on. We're putting it in our Twitter poll. All, All right, right, listen. Uh, so everybody, thank you for listening to us. Um, I'll put it in right now so people know. Thank you for listening. Uh, please chime in on Twitter with your opinion on whether or not uh, cheese pizza is just breadsticks with marinara sauce. Um, and also, if, you, if you're if you so inclined, you could tell us what you thought of episode three of season seven of Game of Thrones entitled The Queen's Justice. Uh, this has been an evening at the Quill and Tankard. I am Michael, a.k.a. Bookshelf Stud. And I am Eliana, a.k.a. Glass Table Girl. I'm Joe Magician, also known as Matt. I'm Samuel, a.k.a. Sam R. Aaron. <laughs> I don't know who I am anymore. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you a pizza? He's are you French with some hair and Every sauce? time I Furiously. spell bananas, I have to B A A N A S. God. Yep. Why are you googling bananas? I'm bad and with at that, spelling. we end. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Um, <laughs> please follow us on Twitter at Maester Monthly. You can find our blog maestermonthly.wordpress.com where all the episodes are posted. You can find us on iTunes and Google Play. You can always find us on the Song of Ice and Fire subreddit. And of course, follow us on Twitter and smash that MF and like button. On YouTube. On YouTube. You can also find us on YouTube. That's actually the major place to find us. That's where most of our best content is. I completely forgot about it. So check out YouTube. (laughs) Maester Monthly. Smash it. Most unclear poll ever. Smash that. (laughs) 